Uh, very, very quickly, the, maybe the three questions. What are the puzzles? Why do we need to address this now? How do authoritarians exert control? And what do we do for survey research in this regard? So these are the key puzzles which I think we're being posed, not just by Trump and not just by Europe, but by all the developments around the world, whether it's Modi, whether it's Turkey, whether it's uh, Venezuela, whether it's countries which are moving backwards like Hungary. First, what is going on? You think about this, the standard theories about what causes democratic rise, they don't help to explain democratic decline. So it's Lipset and it's prosperity. And sorry, most of the developing world is moving up and yet we see these backlashes going on. Uh, and we can think about a range of other theories which are out there that don't work. So the first thing is, we really need to rethink our theories. Then we need to think about what are the consequences. Does this matter? How much does it matter? For example, with Trump, is it actually going to cause long-term damage to American democracy? Or is it a temporary blip, which we go back and forth over the years? And then how do we mitigate the risks? Is the large, big question for the international This just shows you the problem, and we're all familiar with it. This is the democracy index, I can show you the EDEM index, I can show you various others. Simple point is that the decline in democratization or the rise of authoritarianism or backlash, however you describe it, is not enormous so far, but we can see an incredibly checkered pattern. And in particular, what's happening is the hybrid states or the states which are flawed democracies are the ones which are the most vulnerable. So we can think about Hungary, changed in the fall of the Berlin Wall, moved backwards rapidly and is going even further backwards. So is Poland. Venezuela was one of the most long-standing democracies in Latin America and has moved really backwards, the worst economic collapse of any country without a war. Mali has recently has gone backwards, it was my, and Benin, which were my hopes in Africa. And we can see large parts of, of places in Asia, such as the Philippines under Duterte, which have gone back in the Middle If we keep thinking that, it doesn't fit the way <coughs> And this is the way from Huntington updated with the video data. And what you can see immediately is that we know that there have been previous periods of going backwards into war and in the 1960s with decolonization, an enormous advance. And so the basic lesson is that yes, democratization has normally moved forward, we fall back and then move forward. So it's kind of two steps forward, one step back. The last retreat remains under debate, how far are we moving backwards? If you look at the aggregate figures, which these are, at national level, then it doesn't look that bad. It has gone backwards, but it can kind of be seen as flat. But if you look at the underlying indicators, freedom of the press, civic society freedom, tolerance of minorities, and a wide range of other issues like that, then the decline is easy. So we have to explain it. And the most important point here, just briefly, is it's not simply what's happening over there, it's happening over here. Uh -huh. Not in Canada, but everywhere else over here. In other words, Australia, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom under Brexit, um, New Zealand. In other words, the Anglo-American democracies you might have thought would be leading the world in charge of democratization, now have the real problems at home. And that's a very marked trend. All of the books which have come out have been calling attention to this and uh, have been producing a tremendous, I think, um, shift in the literature, which is really very healthy. But most of the work, such as How Democracies Die, by my colleagues uh, Zimblatt and Levinsky, or Democracy in Crisis or How Democracy Ends, they're really basically waving the flag. They're saying, this is a worry. They're not putting forward a theory about why it's happening. And they're not putting forward an explanation and nor, by the way, most of these are using very good measures. Most of the measures we have are, are pretty bad, so actually measure this kind of really trend. So, how do authoritarians exert this new control? And if you turn to the next slide, what I'd like to argue is a little controversial, but it's basically that there are these three, three factors. When we think of authoritarian regimes, we're always thinking of oppression. We go back to the literature right from the 1940s and 50s, we think about coercion and force and military and the ways in which populations in countries like Russia or Azerbaijan or countries like North Korea are held down by their leaders. 
And clearly that's still going on. We should not underestimate the degree of oppression in turn. Corruption is also important, and that's particularly in Latin America, where one looks at some of the countries going backwards because of corruption, which is undermining and hollowing out the state, clientelism, creating personal relationships and material incentives. And that's really important also, I think, in the Middle East, where many countries like Bahrain and Saudi do a lot of their control through their control of resources and making sure that the army gets those resources and other forces. But legitimation is the one area which I think we need to really take much more seriously. In the past, it's never thought that authoritarian uh, regimes actually were legitimate or were seen as legitimate. Um, we have drivers on. And I think we now have to realize, not just by Trump, but by other things, that there is active popular consent. How popular? Look at Putin. And in the average polls, he gets something like 80% popularity. Much more than almost any of our Western leaders. Much more than most of the countries we normally study. <coughs> and the popular support, okay, we've always known things like, well, if you look at questions about democracy and how well it's performing, China, Vietnam, 80%, Sweden, 60%. But we've kind of dismissed it. We've said that's not real. We've said that's just a kind of um, people worried, they're not answering the questions. I think no, we have to take it seriously and really try to get more surveys in some of these countries and really try to work out what's happening and to test whether or not the replies we get. If you ask people about support for the regime, if you ask people about confidence in, in parties, if you ask people about a variety of other questions that we always ask. Are they actually honest and genuine answers? And I think that's a tremendous challenge for survey researchers that we're starting to, to work out, but we haven't yet. <laughs> and there are lots of explanations for legitimation. I won't go into it, kind of obvious in a way. But until we get some good measures of legitimation in a wide range of different countries, um, we can't work out, for example, is the Chinese Communist Party actually popular? Is the leader popular because of performance? Economic growth, tremendous transformation in China. Um, is, is Putin popular because of Ukraine, reasserting Russian nationalism? Um, is it that they actually rather like that type of government? For example, that there is still support for inherited monarchies in the Middle East, and therefore that legitimates, for example, Qatar. Um, is it identity? People feel that the leaders like themselves, or ideologically similar? Is it the control of communications in the tightest regimes in the North Korea's world, but people don't know anything else? So they might say in a poll that they like their leader because they really haven't got a clue about what else is happening. Indoctrination, pure and simple, or international recognition that the, the country is seen as uh, legitimate. So the last slide, to briefly sum up, is we actually need to get our heads around this. And I think this is, for me, the um, agenda for the World Bank of Survey 8, I have to say. I know we're in still in 7, but we have to see it now for other surveys around the world that we have to work out what's happening. And <clears throat> some very challenging points um, for us. We can't simply, simply keep on asking about democracy. I'm sorry, we asked about that lots of times. Do you like democracy? Do you really like democracy? Do you like democracy this way, that way, or the other? I'm not saying it's not important. It is, but <laughs> to say that you like or do not like democracy does not tell you anything necessarily about authoritarianism. It's not simply a black and white yin yang Thing. I can both like democracy if I'm an American, and yet like lots of undemocratic practices, right? Survey items measure attitudes towards regimes. We have some of those, Pew in particular, and us, the world values. So we asked, would you like the arms rule, etc., etc. But there are so many varieties of authoritarianism and autocracy. We often don't capture that, and often our attitudes aren't anything to do with the regime. It's other practices that we want like to condone, which are not democratic. So we have to understand authoritarian values. Um, Ron just mentioned we have the childhood scale right back from the 1950s that we can use, which is great. Do you, obey, do you want your child to have obedience and manners, etc.? But you know, it's very creaky. Um, it's been around forever, so we use it, but hey, we must be able to do better than that. We have the short scale, which is great. But we need more things on authoritarian values, absolutely much more on the liberal practices, trade off questions. Um, you know, about, for example, access to welfare if you're an immigrant, or uh, whether we should uh, curb the free press if it's, if, it's, if it's seen as fake. I mean, a whole bunch of complex issues where I think people have really quite uh, illiberal leanings, um, but we haven't got good measures. Social intolerance, we obviously need more on that. Populist appeals, 
we had that in the previous panel. Great. But we really don't know a lot about how we can get at all dimensions of that. Perceptions of group threats. And again, Ron, if group threats are and a, a feeling of insecurity, we absolutely have to measure those group threats about you and your groups. And we do some of that, obviously, about tolerance of your neighbours, but not enough. And then conspiratorial thinking, a wonderful area of authoritarianism. Why do people believe, for example, that the government was in charge of 9 11, um, <clears throat> that there were people on the grass and all, etc., etc.? Very, very much a heart of Trump's conspiratorial world. So there are real challenges, and I would say that there are some ways to get over that. Ranked list experiments is one. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a couple of new articles on this. You don't ask about do you like these leaders and the whole list of leaders with names, you ask how many do you like, and then you kind of shorten the list and you kind of work out whether or not people really like Putin or whether they're just saying that because some they think some are not sure. But I don't have the answers to the methods, but obviously this is the challenge and I think that's everything. Um, so I just want us to think as a community, what are we going to do next? That's my question. Thank you so much. So let me come back to the point which Alessandro raised about we've got a lot of concern, which is absolutely true. Books after books by scholars say in crisis, etc. Uh, it's a growing market, but very little theory. And I just want us to highlight this interesting paradox. We've got lots of explanations about why countries became more democratic. And most of those seem to work in the third wave era. So let me just mention three and why they don't work now. The first theory was obviously Lipset, updated by Tchaikovsky, who argued that the levels of economic development would eventually be rising because as you got the growing middle class, you had more educated people, and civic society, you became more democratic. And yet you can find all sorts of countries like Hungary, which had tremendous economic growth and yet moved exactly the opposite way. And you can find clearly that in many other countries around the world, most of the developing world, we've had rising economic development. Think about India to be one of the instruments for moving millions out of poverty, and yet we have Modi, who has been very restrictive in terms of internationalism. So the economic explanation just doesn't seem to be plausible for those classic lips that towards the arguments. Second set of explanations was institutional. We had Leipzig. Leipzig said, design a nice consociational consensus democracy, power sharing, and that will secure democracy. And yet again, we find that in many of the um, European states with perfect consensus democracies, such as one has nowadays, you find strong backlashes and strong uh, populist parties. The Netherlands, get Wilder, Sweden, Swedish Democrats, uh, Norway, uh, progressive party. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but basically, majoritarian systems have problems, absolutely, and certainly winner take all have problems. But the idea that Leipzig said, which is you build the right type of democracy and you can prevent extremists, absolutely not. In fact, extremists get into power uh, with low majorities. Third explanation, and, and then I'll just shut up a bit. Third explanation about why countries became democratic international forces. You join a regional association like the OAS or OSCE or the EU and the conditions of joining, and then the pressures of being part of that regional association when you had a more democratic <laughs> set of countries in the region, meant you would be more democratic. And that was a whole bunch of writers who talk, talk about that, international relations. And yet again, you can see how powerless OAS is to stop Venezuela. They make sounds, but they don't actually have any teeth. They are completely like that. And certainly the same is true in, in other pressures in Latin America. In Argentina and Brazil, OAS has not been effective, I'd argue. And again, Europe, what's happening? And this is the most dramatic case. Everybody said you had conditionality to join Europe. Absolutely. They, that was the best example of how joining a regional association meant you had incentives to make your house more democratic. What happens once you join is those very same forces, which have now moved backwards, are destroying the European Union. And I think the European Union parliamentary elections are going to see a dramatic push up on a polarised basis, it's not all on populist authoritarians. The best projection I've seen by policy also says that Green Party is going to do remarkably well, and so are a number of other um, liberal parties, but ALDE is going to do quite well. But the point is that joining a regional association is no longer associated with maintaining democracies for those member states, because it can go the other way, particularly if they start to gain power 
And the latest projection is that the populist parties of various sorts are going to increase their share of seats in the parliament, but still not in any way become the largest. They're going to become the fifth largest group in all, depending on how you put together the Forest Star movement, blah, 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 Brexit and so on. So um, three explanations don't work. And that really says that's a challenge. And it's a bit like a paradigm shift. Um, we're still working with the old theories because we've had them for 40 years, ever since the 1970s. Um, and we don't have good theories about why democracy went down in the previous two declines. Why did it go down in the 20s? Well, we say it's the recession and the war. But, you know, that's kind of a one-off explanation. It doesn't work, obviously, now. And then we, we talk about why, does, why did they go down in the 60s? And we say decolonization. We set up kind of paper parliaments, but they didn't hold. Well, that explanation doesn't work now. So we're, I think, in a kind of intellectual crisis, which is an opportunity, to use a cliche, um, to say you've got to get some new thinking along with new measures about what's going on. And the backlash, I think, is a good way of thinking about it. Um, a temporal shift to do with the size of groups in the population and the fact that the majorities that were there are now under cultural threat. Uh, and the tipping point thesis of the proportions of the populations who hold whether it's libertarian values or post materialist values or other types of lib progressive values, and the proportion of traditional conservative materialist authoritarian values. That tipping point creates the tension and the polarization. But even that's got so many questions as well. So we're, we're, we're worried, we are concerned, and we don't know the answers, which is good to know. <laughs>